I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. And I'll read the opening 11 verses, verses 1 through 11. Let us give attention to the reading of God's holy word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, who is present with us this day, who centuries ago had John the Apostle write these words, these words that are true words of our Lord Jesus Christ, would you be pleased now to write them upon our minds, our hearts, that we might love them and know them and follow them, to the glory of your name. Amen. I received an email uh, from someone in the congregation this week, and it doesn't matter about the body of the message, but the way it ended, I thought, was uh, striking to me. The ending was, may you have a Jesus-filled day. And I thought for a moment as I was reading that and I was thinking about last week's sermon where we talked about abiding in Christ and I, I said to myself, yeah, I think this person gets it. Uh, that's, is that not what is being spoken about here? Uh, is not the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, inviting, promising, even commanding us to live day by day moment by moment, with him. Ten times in 11 verses, some form of the word abide is used. Sometimes it's just a statement, uh, as I abide in my Father's commands or, or whatever. Sometimes it comes as that command, abide in me, I, the promise, I will. But ten times in 11 verses. Surely that is what he is doing here. And of course, he can, he can offer this, uh, this kind of experience, this kind of reality and, and relationship at this moment because he continues to live today and forever. One of the interesting things that proves that the Gospels are not biographies, it dawned on me some time ago, is how do biographies end? Biographies generally end, one of their last chapters is about the death of the person. And then maybe you have a chapter of some of the implications of his actions, but he's dead. The Gospels never end that way. They end with the Lord very much alive. And he is alive and promising and asking and commanding, come, let's live life together. By way of review from last week, we covered the basics of this extended illustration that the Lord is using about the vineyard. He is the vine, 
the true vine, uh, where Israel failed in that. His father is the vine dresser, and we spoke about what the father did. The father will either uh, take away those fruitless branches that are not part of the vine, not connected to the vine, or he will purge the true branches that are connected to the vine. And we are the branches. Uh, the point is that we are completely unable to live for God. We are utterly dependent on his life being given to us if we are going to live in any manner pleasing to God. That life comes by abiding in Christ. And we mentioned a few things there uh, last week. The Greek word meno means to dwell or remain. We are to dwell with and remain with Jesus the Christ. And what, is, what does that begin to mean? Well, we, we mentioned that uh, one person said, it is the active cultivation by every professing Christian of a living spiritual relationship to Christ, living in the daily exercise of saving faith. Uh, others use language of leaning on Christ, of resting on Christ, of pouring out our hearts to the Lord Jesus, of using him as our fountain of life, to, uh, it ha to have his words abiding in us. One of the times that we read just now, he says, uh, let my words, my commandments abide in you. It is also to experience his love. One of the times he says that we just read, abide in my love. And so we rest in this fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has loved his people. And it's an amazing thing. It is not the love of just grace. He says, as the Father has loved me and as I love my Father, so now I want you to experience my love. The Father does not love Jesus in a gracious way in the sense that he's got to love him in spite of Jesus' deficiencies. There are no deficiencies in Jesus. There is complacency. There is delight between the Father and the Son in their love for one another. There is, you might say, the smile. I think most of us struggle to realize what Jesus is saying here. I'm loving you like I love my Father, that he smiles when he looks upon us, that he delights in us. Yes, there is forgiveness and grace desperately needed, but it is, oh, bigger than that. So that is what he's calling us to. My fear as we deal with these wonderful truths that have been revealed in John chapter 14 and 15 now, is perhaps we unintentionally view them as, well, they're nice thoughts. They're kind of some vague concepts. It's hard to get your hands on something. We wish it was as solid as this pulpit or something that we could grab hold of. And we maybe leave the service saying, well, that was really nice, but now it's back to the real world. And what I want us to understand is these things are absolutely as real as pulpits and hymnals and the pews you sit on. At the root of the Christian life lies the belief in the invisible. The object of our faith is unseen, it is unseen, but it is unseen reality. A.W. Tozer picks up on this. Concerning the revelation of God, God revealing himself to us as a person and as a father and such, he says, now personality and fatherhood carry with them the idea of the possibility of personal acquaintance. The Bible assumes as a self-evident fact, listen to what he says and see if this is your experience. The Bible assumes as a self-evident fact that men can know God with at least the same degree of immediacy as they know any other person or thing that comes within the field of their experience. I wonder if we really approach life like that. He goes ahead and says, God himself, and it's true, God himself is here waiting our response to his real presence. This eternal world will come alive to us, Tozer says, 
the moment we begin to reckon upon its reality. Well, we're going to talk about some things today that are real. I've used them in main points. Uh, there are five of them. These are, I entitled the sermon, The Benefits of Abiding in Christ, because there are several things here that we want to understand that will characterize our lives if we will hear our Lord's command and invitation to abide in him. So, first one, our first main point, abiding in Christ delivers from the reality, delivers from the reality of the fires of hell. We touched on that last week as we spoke about those branches that are dry and withered because they are not connected. There's no life flowing into them. John 15, verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. They're cast into the fire and burned. It is obvious in scripture when you use this kind of imagery and the issue of fire, it's regularly used to depict the torments awaiting those who stand under God's judgment for sin. Jesus is speaking here of God's judgment, not just on sinners in general, however, but we all need to hear this because he is especially speaking, I'm convinced, of those who profess faith in him. They are outwardly associated with the visible people of God, and yet they do not possess saving life. The obvious person in this context was Judas Iscariot, obviously associated outwardly with the visible assembly of the disciples, fooled them all, and yet a branch for the fire. But the good news you see here is, and we want to hear that, but our point today is a positive one. Would you escape that judgment? The invitation is there. It is a benefit of abiding in Christ. Our good brother Brian, last week at um, our Backyard Fellowship, which was here at the church, spoke about these things. He was using uh, Horatio Spafford's hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, and Spafford in there speaks about the, uh, his helpless estate. And Brian rightly brought to our, our comfort the truth. Oh, God did not leave us in our helpless estate, but he has sent a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, and in simple faith that acknowledges our utter inability to save ourselves, we see our absolute need upon him, we understand his all-sufficient work on the cross for us, we continue to cling to him. That's saving faith. Paul will speak in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 this way, and what good news this is. He says, they themselves, others reporting about speaking to Paul about the Thessalonians conduct he says they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus and how does Paul describe Jesus Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come oh it's a reality Praise God for our Savior that we can abide in. That's one of our benefits, and what a mighty benefit it is. The second one, abiding in Christ causes real fruit, more fruit, and much fruit to be born. Um, you see it in verse 2, every branch that does not bear fruit prunes, but that it may bear more fruit. In verse 5, it says, uh, basically the same thing. Now, what is this fruit that is talking about here? I think we can easily summarize this without getting into a lot of specifics. I, I'm going to do it this way. I think we talk about, the first of all, the fruit in me. What I'm talking about is my character. We're talking about my life. If the life of Jesus is being imparted to me according to this illustration of a vine pouring out its sap into the branches... If the life of Jesus is imparted to me, then I should be able to detect a growing conformity to him, his graces, and his conduct. It's why, of course, Paul will have in the epistles and others in the epistles will speak about this is the example of Jesus Christ. We ought to follow that. 
It's in accord with the life that he lived. And of course, that's why we read this morning from Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, yes, and the Spirit of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience. There ought to be some resemblance of that growing in my life. Then, of course, there is not only fruit in me, but I think you might say fruit by me. Uh, so it's not just the inner character, I think, that it qualifies for fruitfulness, but it is the actions of a Christian out in the world, of loving God's people, of maintaining faithfulness to Christ before the watching world, of being involved in acts of mercy and kindness, of supporting the work of form, of all the things we're involved in. There ought to be that kind of fruitfulness. Now this can be an area of great guilt to some Christians because it, particularly those of us who, who tend to be of a more self-critical mindset. We seldom give ourselves any praise and find it hard to do, very easy. We have sensitive consciences and, and pick up on sin and we think, oh, I don't know if I'm bearing any fruit. I think John Newton, his quote, which is famous, uh, applies. He said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. This is John Newton, the famous preacher and hymn writer and such. Not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And one more thing about this. I was looking for an opportunity to mention this event in my own life um, that happened at General Assembly, and I think this is the, a good point to do it. Don't fall into the trap of thinking you know how fruitful you are. You don't. I was at the General Assembly. The General Assembly has an area, an exhibitor's hall, and you have different booths and things, and I was talking with a person, a past acquaintance, all the way back when I was not even ordained. I was... Uh, uh, I'd been licensed by the Presbytery in, in South Alabama and had preached at this man's church and we just happened to run into one another. He was at this one booth and we were talking and, and we renewed a little bit of an acquaintance. I said, yeah, I'm Bill Clark. I was in Montgomery, Alabama, and, et cetera. And we talked a little bit, finished that conversation and I turned and the, there was a man, just uh, uh, you know, basically my same age, in the next booth and he immediately comes up to me and says did I hear you say your name is Bill Clark that you're from Montgomery Alabama and I said yes and he said I'm Chester Replogle do you remember me and I thought for a moment how do you forget a name like Chester Replogle of course of course I remember Chester Chester he said he says He's speaking to me, he says, you were a senior at the University of Alabama and leading the InterVarsity chapter. You and your roommate welcomed me, took me to the Bible studies. You brought me to, to Riverwood Presbyterian Church. My good friend John Robertson is currently in the stated clerk's office. He was the uh, church planning pastor for Riverwood Presbyterian Church in Tuscaloosa. And, and, and I came to campus out of a liberal Methodist church, and the Lord taught me the biblical and reformed faith through you. I later got a Bible study and led my then girlfriend through it. We got engaged and got married. She adopted the reformed faith. We served in the military and were recently retired. And the booth that he was in was, had the label on it, the Ministry to the Military and International. It's a ministry of Southeast Presbytery, Alabama Presbytery, and, it's, and their purpose is to establish Presbyterian and Reformed churches overseas to meet the spiritual needs of United States military personnel. Uh, I've got a good friend, uh, Steve Walton. He is currently at their church, Covenant Fellowship Church in Stuttgart. There are six churches out there. Now I'm not saying that I'm responsible for, for six churches existed, existing, some in Japan and some in Italy, Italy and some in Germany. But he's the one that said that. He's the one 
that said, Bill, you did this. 42 years, I didn't have a clue that anything I did like that was going on in Chester's life. So I, want, I say that to, to encourage you. Don't you say, I'm just a middle school student. I'm just a high school student. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, over there at UConn. Oh, I, well, I'm just a single adult. Don't say those things. You have no idea what God is doing, will do through your life. The great principle is that of 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Paul writing this says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards, stewards one thing, that they be found faithful. Today, you faithfully abide in Jesus. And you leave, you leave the full comprehension of fruitfulness to God. You will bear fruit, abiding in Jesus. Main point three. Abiding in Christ gives real power in prayer. Verse seven. If you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This promise is basically the same as that made earlier in John 14, verses 13 through 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The temptation, I remember mentioning it in that sermon back in John 14, and the temptation today is for us to hear that these, this repetition of promises of power, answered uh, prayers, to hear that, and then we begin to think, well, he's not, he's not necessarily going to give me the money I want, or uh, I, I'm single, I may not get married, um, my health, and, and we begin to create all of these, these ideas uh, of prayers, perhaps, that we've made and that we haven't seen anything, and the end result is that we dismiss these clear statements of Scripture. The key is to pray in his name and with his words abiding in us. Prayers that are regulated by the scriptures. It is true. We cannot expect comfortable circumstances, absence of trials, excellent health forever and ever. We can't expect God to operate on our timetable. But we can, as the old Puritan said, Plead the promises of God. That is, in essence, what is, he is saying here. Palmer Robertson, in his book, A Way to Pray, which is based on Matthew Henry's uh, book on prayer, says this, makes it very clear. He says, God has made promises to his people. His people respond by redirecting those promises to the Lord in the form of prayer. How could a God who is faithful to his word fail to answer prayers of that kind? He has promised. He will honor that promise. If Christians would join together and form their prayers with the maturity and insight provided by Scripture itself, the impact on the world could not be measured. What could be more obvious as a proper method of praying? than taking the promises of God and saying, Lord, you are faithful. You have promised this. Please do it. Please fulfill it. And to plead like that. So if we want to know the secret, if you want to call it a secret, to the power in prayer, it is to live closely enough to Christ. To what? Abide with Christ. Our own desires expressed in prayer will have been molded by him, by his life, by his priorities, by his word. How many prayers do you know of that Jesus prayed that were not answered? I don't think I know of any. There it is. Main point four. So we've spoken about 
escaping the wrath. We've spoken about fruitfulness, these benefits. Uh, we've spoken about power in prayer. And now we speak about another benefit that is mentioned in our text. Abiding in Christ fills us with real, solid joy. Did you see how the section ended? Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you. What things? Well, we could say all of these things in the upper room, but particularly the previous 10 verses. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Brothers and sisters, hear this. The world is shouting to you that it knows where joy is, that it knows what joy is, they're shouting out, your God is some type of killjoy, some type of ogre, one who would stamp out human joy wherever he sees it, that the ways of God are restricting, they're burdensome, they're confining, they're hard and on and on, and it, it is an absolute lie. We need to hear that. The Lord Jesus in this text says that if we abide in him, Abiding, remember, in his love, the smile of his face upon us. Proving that we are abiding in him by abiding in his words and commandments. He says we will know his joy, yea, fullness of joy. Satan, the world, sinful flesh, all of it wants to tell you, Joy is available away from God. Whatever the medium that would be, we don't need to go into all the possible things. The truth is, and I, I, I particularly want you younger people to hear this. When I say younger people, I'm thinking uh, maybe you're in elementary school, maybe again, students and, and such. There's a lot of temptation out there. A lot of times, you may feel squelched by your parents or whatever, not having the joy, the fun you want. But hear closely. The truth is, God has linked together in every human being holiness and happiness. That's the truth. What God has joined together, we must not think we can put asunder you will find every pursuit apart from God eventually to be sour, to be bitter, to cause you guilt. No, abiding in Christ gives joy, not just any joy. He says his joy, godly joy. Lastly, fifth point. Abiding in Christ really glorifies the Father. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Here I think we have that overarching, inclusive, culminating statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. As, as we are abiding in Christ and therefore bearing fruit, being effective in prayer, living a joy-filled life in this world, we're bringing glory to the Father. Richard Phillips, writing on this, says, listen, he says this, God the Father has decreed that through his creation, yes, but even more, through the redemption of lost sinners by the blood of his own son, he will show forth his glory in ever greater majesty. The transformation of men and women really and truly brings glory to God as well as joy in the presence of the angels. You have that ability by abiding in Christ. You see, the world, it's easy for the world to understand hypocrites. It's easy for them to understand false professors. It's easy for them to understand empty ritualism. But a real saint is a wonder. Turns the world upside down. 
Jesus had said much earlier in his ministry, he said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine, parenthesis, through abiding in Jesus. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and what? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As I prepared this sermon, I noticed numerous items, if you will, that the Lord Jesus claims is his. He says he is that true vine. Did you pick up on the fact that it is my Father, my words, verse 7, you're my disciples, verse 8, it's my love, it's my commandments, it's my joy. Who knows, maybe that old childhood answer in Sunday school to any and every question, you know, you ask a four-year-old in Sunday school, what is this or that or whatever, they say, Jesus. Who knows, maybe that's really true, right? All those things are his, and he invites us to true life in him. Real life only comes from him. You only have one existence in this world, one, one, one pass through, no reincarnation. What kind of life do you want to live? Maybe better question, do you really want to live? Then, in, then abide in Jesus. Got to end this way. May today and the rest of your days really be Jesus filled. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how do we pray? Well, we certainly should pray according to your words, your promises. And so we hear afresh this day the extension from you through your living word, the command, the invitation, the receptivity on your part for us to abide in you, to remain with you, to come to you, to lean upon you, to rest our weary souls in you, to find all we really need for life, for the forgiveness of sins, a cleared conscience, a real hope, an eternal uh, destination, a real purpose in life of giving glory to you. Lord Jesus, please write these realities upon our souls. Let us rise soon from this meeting, this worship service, in this joy that you promise for what you do for sinners such as we are. And we're making these prayers in your name. Amen.